Welcome. We're glad that you're joining us with the fourth webinar for Scenarios Planners. Um, you're a part of the cohort of the 2010-2011 Regional Planning and Challenge Grantee Group. We're happy that you're joining us today. We have participants from across the country, uh, 38 states, I believe. So welcome all of you, whether you're eating lunch or uh, enjoying an afternoon snack or somewhere in between. My name is, is Christy Ostema, and I'm the Deputy Planning Director with Envision Utah. And I'm a part of the Scenarios Planning Capacity Building Team, which is comprised of Envision Utah, Greg NSC Associates, and Robert Grow Consulting. Presenting with me today is Kevin Faleys, our Community Relations Manager, and Tom Madrecki, the Press Manager for Smart Growth America. And we hope that you find We the People, Community Engagement, and Workshops for Scenario Planning helpful today. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to log those during the presentation itself, and we'll have a Q&A afterward. So with that, we'll get started. The Scenarios Planning Capacity Building offerings include half a dozen webinars this spring, in-person meetings. We had one in, in Detroit for the Scenarios Planning Cohort last month. We're looking forward to getting together again in Charlotte, North Carolina, May 7 and 8. So feel free to get in on that and, and register if you're not already planning to be a part of it. We have one-to-one -one assistance opportunities available and are working on posting a lot of resource materials to the Learning Network that you can access um, already some now. This is a, a, a series of webinars. This is the fourth one that we're having. And um, I'm going to provide a little bit of introduction on the first set of, of, of offerings that we talked about in previous webinars. And then we'll move into today's content. So as an introduction, what is strategic scenarios planning? Well, it's an analysis of alternative scenarios to make wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. So you can think of it as, as a vision that's not a forecast, but rather it's a strategy to preserve the best options for future generations. So scenarios processes contrast today's choices by showing the long-term consequences of those choices. And we do scenarios planning to help the public and today's decision makers understand the long-term choices or the consequences of the choices that they make now. So thinking about the beginning of a scenarios planning process, that includes figuring out um, what your issues are, building partnerships, understanding your values. And visioning really starts with that, values. Values are those, those things that are stable and enduring. Think of those as life's ties as opposed to the waves. They don't change much from generation to generation. They're widely shared and create consensus among diverse groups. And if you satisfy one's values, that's really the basis of a and foundation of personal decision making. So if you can, it can tie back a scenarios planning process to that, that will foster success in your project. There has been, have been a number of, of values research studies done across the United States. Often the values that pop up include personal growth and well-being, education, community, nature, family, security, including employment security, especially these days. And um, some of this research includes values laddering. This is a, a map of Utah values that I'm most familiar with since it's my, my home state. But um, the values are at the top. You see things like self-esteem, personal security, peace of mind. At the bottom, you can see attributes in your community. And um, you can track those values uh, or those attributes up and see how people actually feel about those attributes. If you're addressing crime, um, they feel safe, they worry less, and they have personal security. So you can see how the components of your community affect how people feel and ultimately their values. Another piece of scenarios planning at the front end is identifying your issue, taking care to frame it well. It's often answering the question, what does your community need? What are you afraid your community will lose in the decades ahead? 
often posed as an if this happens, then that will happen. If not, then this. So as an example, Wasatch Canyons tomorrow is a process that we completed a couple years ago in our backyard. This is Salt Lake City. These canyons are home to a number of ski resorts and other recreational opportunities. And um, they're also the source of the city's drinking water. So our if then statement for this process was this. If our population doubles and we protect our watershed, then we enhance our recreational opportunities and preserve our drinking water. If we don't protect our watershed, then we compromise our drinking water and love our canyons to death. So that was a really succinct way of summarizing the issue in that project. When we think of, of partnership building, we think of, of getting a stakeholder group together and these are folks that are respected, trusted, well-known citizens and leaders in your community. They are committed to an honest, open, and fair evaluation of the issues. They're often the people that are affected by the outcome of the process. They're able to implement it. They love your community. And it's important to think of, of a stakeholder group as not a, a coalition with a common agenda, but rather a collaboration of all affected parties. So you're including um, advocates as well as skeptics in this partnership building process. When you're building partnerships, you're also developing and cultivating champions. You likely have um, particularly one or two of them that become the public face of your process. They're able to deliver your message, articulate persuasively and passionately about the community's values, the issues. They're trusted by diverse constituencies, and they love your community. Now, oftentimes, this is not necessarily a political person, but rather a, a business leader or other community leader that can work aside, alongside politicians in the future. Another set of, um, of issues that you're thinking about at the beginning of a scenarios planning process and that we've covered on, on previous webinars includes data assessment and modeling. And this is the, the part of the process where you're just asking, where are we now and where are we headed? So you're working from those values and core issues. You're developing analysis, doing research, um, developing findings from data. You're identifying potential measures. You're modeling tool and developing a, a baseline projection or reference case. So you're asking, where are we now? Where are we headed? Getting ready to ask the public, where do we want to head? So by way of an example, this is um, a case study we'll be using throughout the webinar today. It's, it's called Envision Cache Valley. It's um, a community or region just outside the, the larger Salt Lake City metro area, right on the edge. It's seeing a lot of growth. It was about 150,000 people just a couple of years ago, and within 30 years it'll reach a quarter million. And so their issue statement is this, or if them statement. If we double our population and don't change our growth patterns, we will lose the character and quality of life in our valley. And it's a beautiful valley. You'll see images of that later. It's a place that people connect to and love dearly. Some of the data that you're looking at, for instance, you can look at population um, trends over time. You can look at a projection. Here we see that it took 150 years for the first 150,000 people to reach the valley, and it will take only 30 for the second. So that rate of growth is very, very quick relative to previous decades. We can illustrate that by showing where growth has happened in the past, the kind of growth it was, and projecting that out, doubling the population, and show pictures of what that looks like. And this is, uh, these are stills from a flyover we did uh, that visualizes that baseline or reference case scenario. So you can see that the cities grow into one another over time. And the suburban pattern of development that's different there has, than their earlier historic pattern has a great impact on agricultural land. So that brings us up to this, uh, this focus for today's webinar, engagement and workshops. And at this point, I'm going to turn the time over to my colleague, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Phelis. And uh, as you can see on this, uh, this slide here, it's a rough timeline of meetings. And I want to emphasize that 
uh, most of what I'll be talking about today is behind the scenes. These are activities that ideally you want to be doing three to six months before your, your first public meeting, before your kickoff. And also you'll notice that uh, the public workshops has Christie's name there. Um, I'm not going to be speaking so much about the workshops, but Christie will. But it's important for you to see where, where it fits in this uh, chronology of events. And I'll briefly mention uh, what to do with the concluding event, because there we'll be um, going into more detail at the May 24th webinar. OK, behind the scenes, work with your stakeholders on outreach. Your stakeholders are your ambassadors. They're your advisors. Use their expertise and their contacts. Uh, you recognize a gentleman in the middle. That's the uh, Republican presidential candidate, John Huntsman Jr., back when he was governor. Now, to his right is the Salt Lake County mayor, a Democrat, and to the far right is the Salt Lake City mayor, another Democrat. These individuals had different perspectives, different viewpoints, but they came together and they participated in a stakeholder process for the Wasatch Canyons. And so it's important to find that common ground, and often when you look out to the horizon, you can have that common ground. Now also, with your stakeholders, you're going to help craft messages for them. Um, so here we have an elevator speech. For those of you who don't know what an elevator speech is, and I'm talking to you, Amy, it's the speech that you would share with somebody if you were in the elevator and you had 30 seconds. So who are you? you know, what's, your, what's your process? What are you going to do? Why does it matter? It's, it's essentially that uh, if-then statement. And so craft those messages for your stakeholders so that as they're out and about, they'll know what to share. Um, they'll know how to briefly get to the point on your process. Now, you'll notice how the format I have here, uh, identify key individuals or groups, elevator speech, and now we're talking about draft email invitations. So that's the format that I'm going to use today, these little bullet points. So again, you want to craft materials for your stakeholders, uh, talking points, invitations. You know, perhaps you create this information, you send it to them, and then they send it out as emails. Help them have the, the, the tools to be successful and to use their contacts. I, I can't emphasize how important stakeholders are in helping to share the message. Letters from chairs, draft information um, that your chairs can use, again, as they send it out, uh, whether they mail it out or it's uh, email. In the past, we found uh, a lot of success in having an elected official, a mayor, send out an invitation letter. More recently, we're using uh, email invitations, but, but both methods are effective. Working with your stakeholders to develop logos uh, is not often fun. It can be time consuming, but it's a way for them to contribute. And, and logos are important. It helps, as you know, um, indicate the identity of a process. Now early on with your stakeholders, you also want to talk about your implementation committee. Um, now you want to think about, at the end of the day, as, as you have your recommendations from the process, how will you implement those? Now this does not mean there are any preconceived notions. It's not. It's an open, transparent process. We have confidence in the process itself. But you need to be thinking early, do you have the right people involved in your process to get educated so that they can implement whatever comes out? All right, so we've talked about working with your stakeholders. Now we'll shift gears a little bit and think about some tools uh, to develop. A project website is very important. Um, as you notice in this example on the right, uh, Wasatch Canyons Tomorrow, it's very basic uh, setup. But you can see um, how we can share information with people, invite them to take surveys, have resources from open houses or workshops or listed committee members. Um, it's a way to get more uh, feedback from folks. We can list uh, articles we've had in the news. So a website is a very important tool to share information. Another tool is uh, this, all the social media menu. Now, you know, I just learned how to text last summer, so I'm not a young tech savvy kind of guy. So you might need to find someone who knows how to use these tools. 
but they are important and they're again they're they're new avenues to reach out to as many people as you can to gather information they're important so if you personally don't know how to create or run these these tools I hope you can find folks who can maybe they're interns maybe they're they're college students maybe you have the funding to to hire someone to to work on them Another tool is thinking about non-English resources. Is this something that you need to develop? In Utah, for example, 17% of our population now are minorities, with Hispanics or Latinos the largest. So we're starting to get more involved with this and reaching out to, to that community. So consider you know, who, who are the minorities where you live and get them at the table. We want everybody involved. Another tool is drafting guest op-eds. These can be very helpful in letting folks know about your process, inviting them to workshops. Give special consideration to who are the signatories. You know, is it your process's co-chairs? Is it someone else, public sector, private sector? But consider uh, who those signatories are. And also, I would encourage you to create a, a timeline of your activities you may have a guest op-ed at the beginning to help kick off a process. You may have another one in the middle to you know, continue to reach out to folks and have a concluding guest op-ed at the end, announcing next steps, implementation steps. Newspaper and radio ads are great, especially if you have the funding to make those happen. Um, depending on our project, sometimes we've had those resources, other times we have not. Um, running a newspaper or radio ad can help protect you from criticism that you are running some kind of elitist effort rather than a grassroots one. So I would encourage you to have these kind of uh, ads if possible. But at the same time, I found uh, personal phone calls or emails from stakeholders, from those leaders, to be more effective than newspaper ads, radio ads, unless you can just inundate your market. Now this really basic ad on the right here was something that we just designed in-house, you know, uh, very quickly. But we sent this to a local newspaper, and they did email blasts to their subscribers. So this basic ad reached uh, 15,000 people, so it was very helpful. Another tool is a project newsletter. They're especially good when you're in the middle of a process and you're, you're providing an update on what's happening and it's a way to keep folks engaged when you don't have uh, public meetings. This example here uh, was mailed back when we actually mailed things uh, to some 7,000 folks, but consider electronic versions as well. And, and again, it's just another way to have a touch to reach out to folks. Flyers and posters, more tools that, uh, that can be used. And consider having your stakeholders uh, through email, through assignments, uh, put flyers up, put posters up, perhaps in city halls or libraries, uh, popular restaurants, even public events like uh, fairs. So, you know, many hands make light the work. So get a lot of folks involved and have them uh, get the word out. Now, photomorphs are something that are great to tell a story. and. Um, you know, here's downtown Provo, as it is currently, and a photomorph shows what it could look like over time. And photomorphs are especially nice to get a TV coverage of your, your event, your process. So if you're able to do a photomorph, it's a wonderful thing. You know, perhaps students at a nearby university or a college could design one. Maybe get a graphic artist who would donate it. You know. So photomorphs are great. Let's talk now about meeting with some key audiences. Now, reporters and editorial boards, obviously, are, are critical. Uh, here's an example of an editorial from our, our conservative newspaper, The Desert News, Embracing Planning. Now, typically, when we meet with reporters or editorial boards, we just have three or four people. So you consider who should go, who, just by their presence, is, is showing support, is showing um, it's, it's a credible process. So consider who should go, who, who are the messengers. We typically will share a baseline, and the baseline, of course, is this, the, the path the community's on. If you implement current plans, this is what you're going to get. 
So often a baseline serves as a wake-up call. Be real clear on what your process is and what it is not. Some of the key messages that, that we've shared over the years is that our processes respect private property rights. And the recommendations that will come out at the end of the, end of the day are market-based. Um, they'll be implemented locally through the city councils and the planning commissions. Here are some other key audiences to meet with. Obviously, this is not a key list, and that's uh, one of the roles of your stakeholder committee, identifying groups to go to, individuals to meet with. But these are all potential allies, potential critics. So again, go meet with them. Identify what your process is and what it is not, just like you do with the reporters and the editorial boards. You know, find ways that folks like these can help you. Perhaps they can distribute your posters, your flyers, uh, email invitations. Perhaps they can do things like that uh, to their associates, their peers. Another key audience is meeting with, with folks from NAACP or the United Way, you know, folks who are typically underrepresented in these public processes. We believe everyone should have a seat at the table. Giving a presentation to folks at, at say, a housing authority is great. That's important. But what is even more effective is you, if you can get them to host a workshop with their clients and you present to their clients and you involve their clients in your processes. Again, everyone should be at the table. Okay, so now we're talking about the first uh, public event, a, a kickoff. And um, uh, again, all, the, all of these steps that I've mentioned are to get, so far, to get folks to your public events. So your location, that's important. Where are you going to kick off your event? This example on the left here is for our um, Blueprint Jordan River effort. We had 20 or so elected officials come to the Jordan River, which runs through three counties. It spans 58 miles, um, I think it's 18 municipalities. So it's big to us, and there's great potential there. And so we had a kickoff where we had mayors, other elected officials, in canoes. And it was great. And, and they were like fighting to get into the canoe. You know, they, they really wanted to be a part of this. And we had great coverage by the media with this event. The other example on the right is where we used the historic Rio Grande Station to kick off a new transportation and land use vision for the region. So your locations matter. And I, wherever possible, I like to tie into the history of a community. So after you think of your location, consider the format. So here's just an example of how we have done kickoff events. And there's the wealth and the introduction by the chairs. Perhaps an elected official speaks briefly. Again, that's helping with the credibility of the process. A symbolic speaker. Symbolic speaker, uh, when Envision Utah kicked off, for example, we had Brigham Young, who led the Mormon pioneers to the Utah Valley, 1847. You know, he, um, his influence is still being felt in how our communities are designed. So we had an actor portraying Brigham Young come to that kickoff meeting. We've done other efforts where, again, we'll get uh, an actor to come uh, who's representing a local historical figure. And uh, it, it's helpful. It, and this, again, this example in Vision Utah spoke on the process. It's the facts. This is what this is, and it's what it's not. Uh, we have local champions who get up, and, and they're su uh, sharing why they're supporting this, this process. So, and then a question and answer period. And sometimes we've had uh, blank forms so folks can write down what their question is, what their concern is. So it's anonymous, but it's getting the issues out on the table. And so we'll, co we'll collect those, perhaps while the champions are speaking, we'll look for duplicates, and then we answer. So it's, it's a way of maintaining some control, but um, letting folks be heard. That's important. And again, you, know, you need both, uh, we believe you persu persuade with reason, excuse me, you persuade with reason and you motiva motivate with emotion. So you need the warm and fuzzies and the facts. You need both to, to reach folks. Now, prior to each public workshop or open house, 
you're going to continue with all those steps I've, I've gone over quickly. And, and I recognize I'm charging through this, and our emails are at the end of the presentation. So I, I hope you will email me if you have uh, concerns, you want more information. But all of these activities are just trying to build support. Okay. Now, in our timeline, we would now be talking about the workshop. So just keep that in mind. All these activities so far are building up to a kickoff to a workshop. And in a minute, Christy's going to talk about actually running a workshop. But after your workshops, you're going to continue to drive uh, folks to the next events. You're going to continue to, to build support for what you're doing. Ultimately, you're going to have some kind of a concluding event, uh, similar to the kickoff event. And so you can see um, some thoughts there. And again, uh, at the May 24th webinar, we'll talk more about implementation efforts. And so I hope this is helpful. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thanks. OK, we're doing the, the microphone pass here a second. So Kevin's talked to you about a sequence of events that's pretty typical in a community engagement process. And um, it, it's just great to remember that scenarios planning is just that, a, a public process. You're, you're providing research and information to the public. You're seeking broad public input. You're building your vision, your scenarios directly from that input. And you should be using a transparent method throughout so people understand that the input that they provided you with at the beginning um, informs the products in the middle and at the end. And if you're doing this well, you're building momentum for implementation. If um, politicians or other implementers understand that what you're putting together, what you're proposing, represents what people, um, their constituencies care about, they will um, have much more leverage in terms of, and, and motivation in terms of implementing the results of your process. So the premise is this, the public has the right to choose its future. Public officials should serve that vision, and the public will make good choices if presented with real options. And workshops engage the public in that creating and choosing process. So I think they're, they're invaluable. So there are a range of community engagement tools. Kevin hit on a number of them. Um, it is flexible. You can, you, you can put these engagement tools together in, in the way that makes sense to your community. Um, I'm focusing on workshops today uh, just so you can see the, the value of some in-person meetings. And these things really get you to how do you get good information to build alternative scenarios. So you see today we're, we're focusing on the workshop piece, but there's this, this public process that continues to occur after this initial brainstorm um, where you're developing your, your vision and setting the stage for implementation. So at the public workshop stage, you, you understand your values, you know the issues, you've visualized your, your data, you've developed a baseline, you have a communication strategy, and it's the what's next. How do we get from here, this point, to having a range of compelling alternative scenarios? And discovery workshops provide a means of doing that. In Cache Valley, we answered the basic question, how should we accommodate anticipated growth? People are thinking about their children and their grandchildren. Public workshops create opportunity for focused problem solving rather than philosophizing. Um, if, you're, if you're giving people a practical um, problem to address together, having them work together at tables, um, that is a different kind of conversation than somebody who comes to a public meeting with, with an agenda or a soapbox to stand on. This kind of event recognizes competing goals. People get to talk to each other and understand and reconcile differences and find common ground. A longer time horizon is really helpful with this um, in that it can, it can put those, those parcel-based, um, maybe more immediate battles off to the side for a time. So when you prepare for a workshop, there are some basics that you'll probably be contemplating. First of all, some sort of a presentation that frames your issue in a values context. It explores what matters to people. So you're, you're carefully identifying that issue as well as its urgency. Why does it matter? You're showing your, your baseline that you've visualized, and you're proposing, well, what do we want to be in regard to whatever issues it is that you are exploring? I'm going to talk about um, two tools in particular that we used in this process for creating and choosing a keypad poll and a mapping activity today. So the presentation, 
um, the issue. If we double our population and don't change our growth patterns, we will lose the character and quality of life in our valley. And you may have a growth-related issue like this. You may have a different kind of issue. But think of ways you can visualize it and show people. This shows development trends across recent decades, 70s, 80s, more and more recent. You can see the impact of land use decisions and growth over time in this valley. That makes the issue very apparent. Another way to look at it, Logan is, uh, is the largest city in this valley. Well, how much land will new growth use? About the same size as three new Logans, or 50 square miles, if current trend are to continue. This is a simple graphic that I think the, I think the newspapers picked up that one. So are we headed toward the future we want? You're posing a question like, your basic question like that in your presentation. There are sub-questions. What does growth mean for my quality of life, for the quality of life for my children and grandchildren? Um, can we afford to live here? Will there be jobs? Is the air clean? Can I enjoy being, enjoy being outside? Can we maintain our municipal services over time? And it's good. This is a, an image of, of this valley. It's, it's beautiful. Um, it's good to remind people that the future is not some place we're going to, but a place that we're creating. The paths to it are not found they are made. So it's a creative process. And another reminder, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. We do lots of planning and lots of aspects in our lives. So it, it makes sense that as a community, as a region, we are also planning for the future. Um, we wouldn't want to leave that to chance. So a couple of the tools then. Keypad polling is a, is a great way to democratize planning. Keypads are, are, are technology that enable people at a workshop to answer a question in real time. And then the, the collective result pops up on screen. And people get a sense of what, uh, what the collective opinion is and, and what their opinion is relative to that collective voice very different than a public process where maybe a few individuals or a public meeting where maybe a few individuals are very vocal on an issue and feel that they represent the majority. This um, helps people see where their opinions are in relation to others. Then a, a hands-on mapping activity enables those, those collective conversations and concerns to emerge in a, in a graphical way and I'll return to that in a moment. So in terms of a, a poll at a workshop, there are many general questions you can ask about the issues. You can ask uh, how people feel about growth, for instance. You can also ask questions that start to spark thought about the implications of some of the growth choices that people are considering. For example, we asked a number of questions about community attributes that, that tie back to values in Cache Valley, and it, it helps people to start to, to see what some of the implications or um, maybe opposing forces are, um, they, can, they maybe can't have everything on this list. For instance, there may be a conflict between E, building neighborhoods with larger yards, and G, retaining viable agricultural land in the same place. So people start to think about some of those trade-offs and identify some of the things they value more. Um, you can also ask some questions that get a sense for initial opinions, inclinations that have policy implications later on. Generally, what growth pattern makes the most sense, for example. So that gives you a, a, a few questions, and we can, we can post some, some other presentations with full batches of questions onto the, lear onto the Learning Network um, website, too. So, the second event of, of the series of workshops that we did in Cache Valley included a mapping activity where we asked the basic question, how should growth unfold as the population doubles in only 30 years? So the, the practical problem is, where do you put 48,000 new households and 57,000 new jobs? And um, reminding people as they, as they grapple with this question that their input shapes the alternative growth scenarios that then we, we test and explore the impacts of together. So the, the first piece of the mapping exercise was this. Which land should be conserved for future generations? People used Sharpies to identify um, together on, on maps. 
at the workshop of agricultural lands, for instance, they crosshatch with a red sharpie. They might um, identify that same land moments later with a green sharpie for some of the environmental um, aspects or resources on that same ground. So people identified their, um, their wish list, places people valued as they are for open land. The next thing we ask people to do is to consider locations for growth and placemaking. What are those criteria for growth locations? What does it make sense? Is it, is it adjacent to existing communities? Is it creating a new community? Um, and we, we see the gamut at workshops when people explore that issue. They're identified then to, or they're asked then to locate spaces for growth that fit the criteria that they've discussed. Secondly, workshop participants placed chips, little pieces of paper that represent different development patterns and density, um, often a constant acreage, um, to, to identify the patterns that they'd like to see growth assume on the map. So, we supply things like um, like menus that 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 showcase all of these different paper chip options. They describe them, visualize them. For example, you can see a city center option that has 5,000 houses, 5,000 jobs. On the the back page, you see something very different: estate lots or five-acre lots. So lots of options. And then finally, people. After placing uh, the jobs and the households, they're identifying and thinking about how people will get around. So what roads do they anticipate needing or improving? What are the public transportation options they want to see in the future? Or bicycle um, commute routes. And throughout this process, then, they're working together in maybe a group of six or eight people around a table to develop a map. And through that process, in their small group, these collective concerns emerge. But at the end of a workshop, it's really helpful for each of the groups to get up and share. They can share things like, what did, what did they like about their map? What issues did they struggle with? What solutions did they see or come to? And as people share, something really important happens at the workshop itself. People start to see not only common ground among their smaller group, but across workshop participants. And themes start to emerge. So once, uh, I, I guess now you've had a, a chance to kind of see what a, a workshop process was like in Cache Valley, I'd like to back up though and, and fill in some details on preparing for a workshop like this. Knowing that um, your specific tasks are, are maybe different and you can feel free to adapt these tools to, to work in your process. So uh, a couple of notes. It's really helpful in workshops to get your stakeholders to volunteer. Again, these are, these are familiar, trusted faces for workshop participants. You can get them to help set up, clean up, welcome people, sign people in. They can facilitate the mapping activity or other, or other small group activities. I'll talk a bit, a bit about that more in a minute. Um, what this also does with your stakeholder group is build a new level of, of champions as they help people in a workshop process, they become more committed to it themselves. And it also creates that transparency. Your stakeholder group can understand um, where the alternative scenarios or options that you're exploring later on come from. They've seen the, the information develop from, directly from the public in workshops like this. You can incorporate um, facilitators into your process. It works really well if you, if you identify facilitators and have a training maybe an hour or two before your public workshop event. These facilitators can um, help process this along in the small group discussions and your mapping activity. Again, it's a great place for stakeholder committee members to be involved. Um, always important to remind facilitators that they are, they're facilitating, they're not leading, and um, that their task is to, to help the group get through a problem-solving exercise rather than uh, philosophizing. So they're, they're identifying and working through the activities and the mapping exercise, for example, that I, I just talked about. If you're doing a, a mapping activity, uh, you'll probably have a base map that people will be working from around your table. And uh, in this age of, of Google Earth, I know it, it may be hard to believe, but not everyone can read a map. 
and some people will walk in and be fascinated by it. Your job is to orient them and provide a map that's easy to use. That might uh, mean that you're using some aerial photography or topographic data um, that makes the place clear that you're studying. You might include things like roads, landmark names, existing structures, or water bodies. You see the little, little dots on this map, black ones, um, are our existing structures. That shows people where, where the Logan, the big city is. And um, then you're providing some information that's, that's pertinent to issues if needed. So you have to walk this line in, in a careful way. You don't want to lead people in one direction or another. Um, at a smaller scale, for instance, you might be identifying RDA-owned property, or something like that. At uh, the larger scale, as the map at the right, you might be identifying things like national forest land or steep slopes or other ecological concerns that, uh, that people will be asking about and want to understand as they plan for the future um, together. The data, of course, is dependent on, on your scale and your set of issues. You can think of a, a base map as a canvas that's been partially painted. So it's, it's not a blank slate, but it's certainly a creative space. A couple notes about, about shifts. The trade-offs get very clear if you're, if you're careful to scale your chips to your map. So for instance, you've got 1,500 homes in the three yellow chips on the left. You've got 1,500 homes in the single chip on your right. And um, it gets pretty apparent how land consumptive or not some of these chips are. And that's, uh, that's an OK conclusion for people to, to draw on their own and to do with what they wish. I've uh, heard a, uh, or seen a number of people in workshops um, bent on, on five-acre lots in rural areas. And they start laying those chips out on their maps. And they start to see how much land those chips consume. And they pick them up and they start to, to make some different choices. And that's OK. That's that's their, um, that's their right to explore those ideas and to draw conclusions as they wish. We have a, a calculator, simple spreadsheet, that uh, helps us scale chips and populate them in preparation for a workshop. We often provide people with some rules. Again, reminder that they're, the chips are to scale, that they can cover up chips to, or uh, cover up existing structures to indicate infill or redevelopment, uh, for instance, in a downtown area. They can make their own chips. The chips are just uh, tools um, that ought to, to give people freedom to express their choices. So they can certainly turn a chip over and create something else. They can divide their chips, cut them up into different shapes or smaller, um, then combine them any way they wish, ultimately accommodating the homes and the jobs in a pattern that they think is best for the future. So. You, uh, you get through the public workshop process. And in Cache Valley, we had more than 50 maps that represented hundreds of voices across the region. So how do you get from all of these maps, all of this full data, to a set of alternative scenarios? You're taking those ideas. You're creating um, a batch of scenarios. You're testing measures that matter to people. And um, so post-workshop, you've got some jobs you can do. You can quantify the data. You compile your, your poll results, whether that's keypad, internet, or paper. You can digitize maps. I'll talk more a bit up about that in a minute. You can count your chips. You can prepare data, your data, basically, for theme identification. This is a great place to use volunteers and interns. So um, I mentioned digitizing maps. That's basically getting your, your map from a paper stage to something you can use and manipulate in a computer. In Cache Valley, we got uh, students from the university to, to stick around after the workshop. They laid an acetate grid. Each grid cell was numbered over the workshop map. They entered um, uh, where there was, was activity on the map. They entered that onto, into an Excel spreadsheet. That Excel spreadsheet um, plugs into GIS. The result is that you can do a lot of um, fairly quick GIS analysis. You can look, for instance, at um, housing trends or a composite, so all, all of the data across all of the maps, um, thinking about employment, what, what people um, express preferences for, where they blended or mixed uses. Lots of different analysis you can run if your information is digitized. You can also have people uh, count chips on individual maps. You can do that and get data like this. 
for instance, two-thirds of all housing on the map was placed in mixed-use patterns. You can identify conservation trends on maps, transportation trends. And you can also get a sense of what you, what you want to measure. I mentioned that, uh, that keypad poll set of questions earlier. These are the top 10 quality of life goals for Cache Valley. So our measures, we could look at air quality. We could see what each scenario did in terms of um, housing prices, for instance. So you have all this data, and it's a, you have it ready now to bring back to your stakeholder group. They can be a part of a, a retreat or, or join a meeting and, and explore together the individual maps, see what the individual maps are exploring, look at your data. Um, they can group maps to see what patterns they see emerging across batches of them. They can identify themes in regard to housing or jobs or transportation or conservation. And they can start to see which ideas work together and could be scenarios. So um, our stakeholder group in Cache Valley looked at a uh, group of maps that identified uh, bench development along the valley edges, um, growth in town centers, in urban centers. They looked at themes like, like density, um, people mixed uses in ways that uh, recent development patterns hadn't. They infilled and redeveloped existing uh, community cores. So we could start to visualize and, and have those conversations about single-use patterns versus mixed-use patterns. Um, evident in Google Earth images from the communities. Um, on the, the left is a, a heart of a downtown that people love. On the right is a, is a pattern of commercial and residential on the edge of, of a town that people didn't like as well. So looking toward patterns like this and like this, exploring, filling in underutilized spaces like old Kmart parking lots to feel a little bit more like their downtowns. So when you're developing a scenario, you're working with your stakeholder committee, you're seeking that transparency that I've mentioned several times. The, the scenarios should come directly from public ideas and your measures should come from public goals. So you, you end up with scenarios that capture those collective ideas. You're modeling things that matter to people. Here's an example of housing costs. And then you're asking people at, at future meetings, which components of those scenarios matter to you? And that gets you down, further down this path, looking toward your eventual vision or plan and an implementation framework. So here's the, some of the vision maps that were created in a result of this, as a result of this process. So I just want to emphasize that the flexibility of community engagement tools and workshops, that it's just uh, dependent on your issues, the scale you're looking at, the context, your community, your people. Um, here's a quick example of, of an urban chip set in the, that we've used uh, just west of downtown Salt Lake City. Really different set than the Cache Valley one I showed you earlier. Similar uh, mapping brainstorm, but different, different scale a few city blocks. We used an aerial photograph here. But same process in terms of theme development that led into scenarios, um, visualizing them for people, helping people see what the consequences of decisions are, and then eventually that, that process of arriving at a vision. So community engagement and, and workshops the process of building champions, providing information on the issues, engaging productive dialogue, democratizing planning, choosing together as a community, and ultimately visioning or planning for the best possible future. At this point, I'd like to turn the time over to Tom, and he's going to talk a little bit more today about uh, challenging audiences in processes like this. Tom is with Smart Growth America, and we welcome him to the webinar. Hi, how is everybody? Um, like uh, the introduction from Smart Growth America, I uh, was originally at UPS before that, um, so my background is more in sort of the corporate world, but I'm transitioning over um, nicely, I think, in the, the few months that I've been at Smart Growth. Um, 
sort of one of the, the unsaid things in all of this discussion and why we're talking about building you know, local champions and, and getting people to speak on these behalf of these issues is to um, counter any of the opposition that is going to you're going to encounter when um, you're, you're embarking on these plans. Um, and in the past year especially, um, smart growth strategies and affiliated programs, um, technical assistance workshops, um, the whole gamut have attracted um, a degree of national opposition that I don't think has um, it's really been taken to another level. Um, and I, I think that the reason is these opposition groups, um, which are likely funded nationally, uh, have gained traction at a local level by marrying long-standing anti-smart growth and land use arguments uh, with Tea Party messaging in a very divisive and increasingly partisan political environment, uh, and by playing into stereotypes, emotional reactions, underlying fears, and sort of a, a general conservative desire to avoid change. Um, the opposition has proven capable of disrupting uh, a lot of local meetings and has emerged as a very credible threat um, insofar as their reach um, and, their, and really their willingness to, I think, blur the lines of truth, um, because we like to sort of operate in a, in a very rational, um, fact-guided world, and th that just doesn't exist to them, and they don't necessarily care. Um, much of the opposition is launching off of, and I, off of what is they from the anti-agenda 21 position. Um, and according to the United Nations, um, for those of you that don't know, Agenda 21 is a comprehensive plan of action to be taken globally, nationally, and locally by organizations of the United Nations system, governments, and major groups in which every area in which humans impact on the environment. Um, so while the ideas embodied in that sound positive, you know, you're talking about sustainable development, things like that, um, the language used by the United Nations, the way that it's put together, and sort of the very body of the United Nations is very easy to misunderstand and misinterpret. And so opposition groups are latching onto that and have messaged Agenda 21 as a conspiracy to undermine uh, U.S. sovereignty and deprive citizens of their property rights. Um, Smart Growth America and others across the country, I think, have done a degree of uh, not, not discounting the, the significance, but playing it down to a degree. Um, and so we're sort of on the, the cusp of really developing, for the first time, a very substantive response to this opposition. Um, but there really does appear to be a growing coordination of that state strategy, uh, of, their, of their opposition. Um, they're trying to pass legislation in several states. Um, I, I, a lot of the, um, the general consensus is that they're, they're doing that through a variety of, you know, not only local tea parties, but coordinating with ALEC, um, getting the same types of legislation in different states. Um, and the RNC even recently adopted a resolution opposing Agenda 21. Um, so really, we really can't take uh, these discussions uh, not seriously. To me, um, sort of the first issue to countering the opposition and to understanding it um, is to play a bit of psychology and to think about um, where the opposition comes from. Um, what is their what is their mindset? What are their motivations? Because ultimately, to me, if I'm going to counter um, any opposition, I want to I want to play into those the, the, their motivations and their emotions. Um, a lot of ways, the language used by the activists sounds absurd. Um, at one meeting, um, a resident um, said, "You know, they get you hooked on sustainable development, and then Agenda 21 takes over, and your rights are stripped one by one." Um, and so they'll sort of, you know, start say it starts with parking meters and it goes from there, um, which which sounds a, a bit crazy. But um, there's also a surprising amount of insight too if you take time to sort of peel back the layers. Um, the anti-agenda 21 right activists are right insofar I think as saying that something is wrong or frightening about the current state of the country to them. Change is happening in their communities, and it's scary. Um, it's just that sort of in the context of uh, sort of an ongoing culture war to some degrees and in seeking, th they want a boogeyman to blame for America's recent difficulties. That concern has been misplaced onto things like smart growth, things like sustainable development, and it's really obscuring the truth of the matter. Um, to me, the root of the issue here is that there's a portion of the country's voting electorate that is afraid of a changing country and for them um, an, uncertain, an uncertain future. Um, advancements in social media, organizing, and other technologies I mean those fears can be grouped in a way um, that for more easily than ever before it gives those causes momentum and um, sort of gives them legs whereas they 
years ago they would have been nullified from the get-go. Um, sort of the fear of Agenda 21 and the opposition to sustainability initiatives, smart growth, um, is a psychological reaction to encountering something that is different. I think in a lot of ways these people are deeply concerned about what is happening all around them. And it could be um, that they are just growing older. It could be that they see a more diverse population. Um, it could be that they, for the first time, they have to confront and deal with the fact that the U.S. Uh, does not stand alone on some pinnacle of economic and military power. Um, but for whatever reason they have, I think it speaks to a lack of identification with the new causes being pushed, whether they are sustainability, smart growth, um, anything on the table really. Um, they can't, they don't see it as part of them, they see it as something that's outside of them. Um, and if people see something as different, if they can't identify with it, um, if they can't really see how it will benefit them, um, then you're going to obviously have a difficulty, a, a difficult time gaining their support. Um, in terms of how this affects us, I think you have to, you know, there's sort of like a bullet point list of the ways that this anti-Agenda 21 opposition um, most clearly impacts the, you know, whether it be planning, whether it be sustainable development, whether it be the community interaction. Um, First, I think it's hurting our ability at the local level um, and in direct technical assistance and you know, when, you're, when you're actually going out and trying to interface with the community. Um, they're really standing up, they're getting in our face. Um, they're interrupting these meetings that ideally are supposed to foster communication and instead they're shutting that communication down. And they see um, very readily that by shutting down that communication, um, they can get what they want. Um, because it kind of plays into it that if they shut down the conversation, well, there wasn't a conversation. Um, we also have a difficult time defining who they are. The um, agenda 21ers, as I'd like to put it, um, they're sort of an amorphous. We've yet to you know, really track down who is heading them, how do they get their message across the country. Um, and in a lot of places now, politicians are gaining traction um, when they come out against agenda 21 or sustainable development. Um, sort of in a partisan political environment. You're seeing a lot of the people that are already very far right-leaning or conservative, you know, they're seeing what their constituents are saying or the most vocal of their constituents are saying, and they're coming out against, in, you know, against Agenda 21. In, you've seen this in Arizona, in Tennessee, in Texas. Um, they come out with a, legisl a piece of legislation that really just is more symbolic, I think, than anything, but it, it plays into these, these underlying fears. Um, and they're using it as a sort of a divisive tool in this culture war and boxing in our image because the more that they attack us, I think it's very, very easy for us to um, obviously want to defend ourselves and to distance ourselves from them and say that they're crazy. And when we say that they're crazy, it's very much us against them. Um, so it's easy to make it seem like we're um, far left-leaning in there far right-leaning and you know we're just never going to come to terms with this. Um, and while we go in this back and forth with them, we're having difficulty making uh, progress with policy and implementation of different things. Um, and on the legislative front, obviously, uh, it's just becoming increasingly difficult to talk even about sustainable development. How do you talk about an issue um, when it's sort of become toxic in a lot of ways? The way that I see the response to this um, I think that there's several levels. I think that there's a media response as well as organizing and meeting discussion responses. Um, but I really think it is that organizing and meeting discussion response that's the most crucial. Um, and it's obviously the, also the most applicable to today's webinar um, because it's the one that actually comes face to face with that opposition and has the most potential to influence how they act. Um, I, I think that we can you can sort of take a lesson from a lot of the, the poor encounters we've had thus far with um, you know, Agenda 21ers and, and sort of look at it um, that what we need to do um, moving forward is a, is a sort of offensive defense um, to really tackle the issue head on well before it um, materializes at a, a local planning meeting or, or something like that. Uh, the first thing is we have to really acknowledge the fact that the opposition does exist. Um, it's no longer a maybe or a hypothetical. Um, you should really start with the assumption that we're going to be challenged um, about land use decisions, about planning, about sustainable development. It's a foregone thing. It's no longer, um, like I said, it's no longer we might have that happen. It just really will. Um, 
And from there, knowing that we will be challenged, we should know we need a response and need to limit how they can challenge us right away. Um, one of the primary ways that they seek to influence local opinion is by suggesting that policies and initiatives are foreign or external to the local process. Um, and I really see this as playing right in line with their members' suspicions about anything from the outside. This is why it's, um, it motivates people. This is why it gets uh, their sides, because it really picks up on residual fears about um, race, about communism, about things that are foreign. Um, so it makes sense that the sooner you can find the local supporters, champions, spokespeople, um, the better. And to be sure, I think that every organization wants to be seen as playing a role in that change. Obviously, Smart Growth America, Envision Utah, we all like to be identifiable. Um, but it ha the, the, the planning process or the, um, the change that's going to take place or be discussed, it has to be seen as so organic and so um, innate to the community that they can't really um, counter it because it's almost as if it's coming from them, that we're not the ones leading it as much as the community is the one leading it. Um, because the, the more that it becomes something of the community, um, they, yeah, they can't counter it as much. Um, by finding and, and, and trusting, especially I think in the, the current economic and political environment, um, local business owners and other local leaders, um, making it their priority, uh, that's also a, a very strong way to, to get our messaging across. Um, it, it really has two benefits. It either means that the opposition must acknowledge uh, a non-Agenda 21 influence, because now the it's no longer Agenda 21 uh, coming out and, and influencing their local land use decision. It's the, the business owner next door um, that he's grown up with his entire life. So how can it, it, it sort of doesn't compute, and, and he has to admit that it's not Agenda 21 that's bringing sustainable development to his community. It's the, the business demand or market demand. Um, and then the, the other thing is that um, it also has the potential to turn themselves turn them against themselves um, just by virtue of, of significantly weakening them and sort of increasing their own um, inability to, to work towards their goals. I think too many times, uh, just as an outsider, it hasn't always been in uh, the sustainability, smart growth arena. Um, those communities come across as vaguely elitist. And if we're telling, um, and as if we're telling people how to do things. And the more that we can limit that, I think that that's also especially powerful. Um, all of these things, finding a local champion, keeping people informed as much as possible, keeping the process transparent, they have to be done well ahead of time for you to achieve success. And it cannot take a back seat, and it cannot be uh, last minute. Um, and really, for the, the purposes of this webinar and talking to you all, this should be framed um, not really as a communication, uh, community discussion issue, but almost as a political campaign issue. Um, it's it, Because there's an opposition, it's kind of, a, in a lot of ways, us against them. And so we have to find ways to target and go after them sort of in a very political um, mindset. So I've come up with general rules um, just to guide and, and inform the response to opposition. And the first one, to me, is always emphasizing economics over anything environmental. Um, the, the, the second is emphasizing common sense. Um, just from the standpoint I've found this very successful, is to talk to people in everyday language. Um, su successful people and businesses plan for the future and react to changes. Why shouldn't our town? Um, it just it just doesn't make sense to not do that. Um, and then it, the, the third is to let other people carry your water. Um, local champions and prominent outreach efforts are a must, and they, they can't really object. The opposition cannot object to ideas if the person raising the issue is just like them. Um, and if you must, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can, I think, tap into their fears and emotions and use those to your advantage, not to your detriment. Um, so it, in a lot of ways, it's if you want your main street to remain a vibrant place to live and work, how can we just do nothing? Um, or the future of this community will depend on whether our children will be, will be willing to stay here and raise families of their own. Um, but unless we give them what they want, we run a terrible risk of them leaving and the town's future going with it. Um, to some degree, I think that there's a need to understand that we sh you only have to have an open meeting um, when you actually need one or when it's been planned properly and when it's all of this, the pieces are in place. To have an open meeting um, that opposition can attend and 
disrupt when you don't have those pieces in place is sort of inviting them to disrupt it and bring things down. Um, and this is something that was used actually very effectively during a lot of the healthcare debate by sucking the air out of the room to some degree by limiting and controlling the discussion, you limit their time that they can actually um, voice their opinions and sort of gain traction. Um, and we can uh, please feel free that if you have any specific questions about messaging, um, shoot me an email or we can discuss those offline. Um, sort of future plans, just very quickly. Um, we're, SGA is currently arranging a lot of workshops and communication strategy sessions um, with a lot of the grantees and other folks that are very involved in encountering this opposition. Um, and we're also putting together a national communication strategy as well that will be more overarching in nature um, and going to work with coalition members and related national groups to, to really hone in on a unified message. Um, but it's, it's, I think, very clear from all of this that it's really ho about honing in on those, those local champions and stakeholders that will be able to really offer the, the best bang for the buck rather than um, large organizations that I think uh, don't gain as much traction against the opposition. 